Um, really, really pleased to be here today and um, I'm going to be talking about uh, open education in the context of the school sector, which I don't know how many of you are working in. You probably have some connection to in terms of your family members if you're not actually working professionally in that area and I'm sure you'll, um, you will have some interest in the school sector. And I'm going to be talking particularly about the school sector um, in England as well, which is uh, a very specific school sector at the moment is in a transformational phase in terms of um, governance and structure. So it's not necessarily the same situation as many European countries, but I'm very confident that the work that I'm going to talk about today has re will have resonance um, right across Europe. So I talked a little bit yesterday um, about a project called DigiLit Leicester, which was a uh, project working specifically with 23, a cohort of 23 schools. So that's uh, around 2,000 staff members supporting around 20,000 learners um, in Leicester. Leicester itself has more schools than that. There's about 115 um, public schools not public in the US sense, public in the UK sense, um, and uh, around supporting around um, uh, supporting many, many more learners of all, all different kinds. But the context that this work grew from was that specific cohort that was secondary school, um, and in the UK that's from age 11 to age 16, or sometimes to age 18 and also a diverse range of schools, so some secondary mainstream schools, but also SEN schools supporting learners with a wide range of different disabilities and also supporting learners who have behavioural, emotional um, or other kinds of issues that means that they've been excluded from mainstream education. So the project was looking at digital literacy in the context of uh, school practice to support educators and to develop the workforce across the city in terms of their um, use of technologies to support teaching and learning and their confidence around um, applying technology to different things. Part of that work involved a kind of benchmarking survey of the staff involved. And we benchmarked across the areas that staff had identified, who had worked with us and identified as priority areas for them in terms of their own digital literacy, in terms of their organisational digital literacy. And one of the things that came out very, very clearly from that piece of research was that within these two specific areas, um, so finding, evaluating and organising strands and creating and sharing strands, um, there was a big gap around copyright, intellectual property and open, and open educational licensing. So obviously that's of concern to anybody working in the area that uh, teaching staff on a daily basis are finding resources online, they're creating electronic resources, they're sharing electronic resources, but with a, with a lack of confidence and information and knowledge around the kind of legal framework and governance and, and, and more practical issues to do with copyright. Obviously, teaching and learning has changed. It's changed because of technology. And practices have changed, and the kind of professional knowledge um, that schools at a leadership level and at a pr practitioner level need have changed. Um, so what this survey basically did was point up that, okay, while practice has changed, while um, the digital has become mainstream within these contexts, there's a huge knowledge gap that's not being supported for staff. And that effectively means that they cannot tap into a huge, huge wealth of resources that are available. They can't, they can't um, take advantage of a specific range of pedagogical and um, practices that are supported by open education because they don't know that it actually exists in the first place. So in this, in this short talk, what I'm going to do really is bring you all right down to the ground level and talk about the kinds of issues and, and 
um, challenges that are going on on the co at the coalface in the classroom that we actually need to think through if we're going to effectively look at open education in the terms of in 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 terms of practice. So the co the survey found majority of staff hadn't heard of um, open licensing OER or Creative Commons. So you can ask staff. Do you know about these things? Are you aware of these things? And even though they'll, for example, use TEDx talks, they won't know or won't have recognised that the licensing attached to those um, resources is open. They'll, they'll kind of have skimmed that. They won't, they, they won't really necessarily know, even when they are open, using open resources, that they are. Another issue is that many staff, and I think this is true for all education sectors, are not aware of their own terms of employment and the larger legal framework of the work that they're producing in terms of um, the IP law. So if I am a staff member working in a school, and this isn't unique to school staff members, this is a kind of a general employment law, the work that I produce within the line of my employment um, is, is effectively owned by my employer. Um, and, and that's a huge issue that we don't really talk about and we don't really look at. In some terms and conditions of, of work, some contracts of work, sometimes that's made explicit. In the university sector, it's always made very, very explicit. In the school sector, it's not always made explicit, and it doesn't have to be made explicit. But even if you are making it explicit, just putting a line in somebody's contract is not actually that helpful and, and doesn't guarantee that they actually understand what's going on. Um, and uh, you can kind of characterise the, the attitude towards copyright that the staff have on, on this kind of spectrum that I call from quiet anxiety. Mm -hmm. So they're silently nervous about it and they're constrained from doing things because of their nervousness and because of their lack of confidence. Or this kind of giddy exceptionalism. And what that means is um, it's a kind of a carefree libertarian attitude to copyright that's reasonably cavalier that's, that basically is, I'm an educator, I'll do what I like. Um, it doesn't matter. And, that's, and that, in a way, is great. In other ways, it's not so great. So, for example, when schools get hit with heavy fines for using copyright material um, and, and also kind of also for prevent, presenting yourself as a professional is, uh, is not great. And for modelling practice for learners, it's not great. So, uh, surrounding that, what we've got um, on the ground is that issues relating to um, copyright and IP have historically been the domain of gatekeepers. So there will be, in schools, typically, somebody who works in the print room, usually, who is in charge of monitoring copyright within that school. And historically, that's kind of worked because what's happened is staff have come to that person and said, I need six million copies of this printing for my class. And that person's gone, no, you can't do that. It's not legal. Or they've gone, yes, we have the license for this. We can do it in this way. And that's kind of worked. And people haven't had to know or had to deal with things. But in digital age, where people are taking sole responsibility themselves for using materials, creating materials, distributing materials. That kind of model completely fails us. Um, so linked to that professional practice, it's, it's a model that's changed and is not no longer fit for purpose. So framing that, we've got a current awareness across governments and it's fantastic to see the slides earlier with governments engaging with open education at such a level. Obviously, it's a very varied pitch at the moment. But there is at least light at the end of the tunnel. Most governments now do recognise in some way that actually there are huge, huge benefits to engaging with and actively pursuing open education practice and open education resources. Digital literacy is becoming recognised as important, but not necessarily linked explicitly to professional practice still. So it's something that people need because the world's changed but it's not necessarily linked to the fact that I, as a professional, working in an environment which is both physical and digital, actually need a core set of skills and competencies. Focus tends to be on learners at national level very often. Um, so, for example, in um, England, we have a new computing curriculum, which is fantastic news, 
but is less well supported at the level of um, schools and of teachers who are supposed to be implementing and supporting learners with that. So if we only focus on learners, we're not doing them a uh, we're doing them a disservice basically because we're not properly supporting staff who need the skills and to support and deliver those, those programmes. And there's a lack of drivers and support. Um, uh, the good news though is that there is a thriving, exciting, energised culture of sharing and creating amongst teachers. They're doing things every day, they're finding um, resources, they're online, they're creating new things. There's no, there's no big gap in terms of their enthusiasm to create and find resources that are best fit for their students. Because, you know, they are, they, they are putting their students for, for first, but it's informal and it's uncredited. And there are brilliant quality resources being created as part of that process that are really good. But what's happening is that because of the um, individual and institutional confusion and lack of confidence around copyright issues, all of that work that's going on is being kept at very small local level. So if I, for example, as an educator, have created this amazing resource, but I've used a bit of somebody else's resource that is one of my colleagues and then I've used another bit of a resource that I found on a file that I had a couple of years ago and I can't actually remember where I got that source and information from. I've created this new resource but in terms of, the, uh, in terms of my rights to use that resource, to have attached my name to that resource, it's very, very shaky and that immediately limits those resources to, to very, a very local closed level. So my colleagues who are my friends may well benefit from that, but I can't openly share it in a way and I can't let people from other places use and build on it. So it, it is quite a serious issue that is closing down opportunity at the moment. Um, how we looked at um, addressing this was a, a few ways and um, I think the, the first talk really clearly illustrated that you can't just do one thing, that there's a range of activities and actions that have to go on to actually support work in this area. Um, I will, um, I'll tweet out the link to the resources that we've produced. Um, one of the key pieces of work we did was to create a clear resource suite for educators um, and this is available online, you can it's openly licensed under CC BY. It's already been taken, remixed, reused internationally. It's been translated into several languages. Um, so it's, it, it's been designed as itself as an OER for other people to take advantage of the work that we've done. And um, Leicester City Council did this in partnership with um, Oxford University. It contains four kind of sections, uh, basically explaining what's open education and what is open um, within the context of the school sector, looking at licensing, finding and remixing, and sharing. Along with that, there's also a practical uh, suite of resources that are kind of walkthroughs that help educators immediately benefit from open education. So there's work around how to incorporate, uh, how to use Flickr, which has been immensely popular with our educators because they're using and looking for high quality images on a daily basis, but they weren't aware that they could very, very easily look for openly licensed images. Um, this um, section is about using um, uh, Wikimedia's book creator tool to create, uh, to extract text and to um, create your own resources from that, which again is immediately useful to educators. Along with kind of resources, one of the important things we did was give permission for staff to openly license the work that they've created in the line of their um, uh, resources created in the line of their work. And this is really, really important because you cannot tell staff, here is the world of open education, we really want you to do this, but at the same time, you're doing not to support them in terms of their own contracts and in terms of the wider legal framework that they're working in. So what this permission does was give them blanket permission to openly license and we um, recommended um, CC BY uh, that as, as the license of choice. I'm going to skip the policy context, we've talked a little bit about that, 
today. Um, the other thing that we did was very hands-on work. So in the talk that I gave yesterday, one of the things that, we, that came apparent is around 23% of the staff um, had a, an issue with their confidence and practice at one of the kind of key areas in at least one area. And that's a significant issue in terms of digital literacy, digital practice and education. So around 23% of staff struggled to, or hadn't been engaging with the use of technology in a way that they'd already identified as actually key to their professional practice. And those staff, that cohort, were the, were the group that were hardest to move in terms of improvement. And that's because those staff actually need hands-on support. You cannot just give them books, you can't just give them information, you can't direct them to great resources about things. To move that cohort on, you actually have to engage with them, provide practical support. Um, one of the things that we did is, uh, as well as a series of workshops and school-based initiatives, we held a, um, a, a huge conference um, to support educators. And these are the questions that schools ask all the time. These are what they're asking about it. What is an open licence and how does it work? And that's an important question to remember because we work in open education, we work in policy, we're doing these things all the time. We need to actually remember that some people this is very, very new to um, and they need support in accessing um, open education on a, on a, on a very um, primary level. Intellectual property and employment is another thing that they're really, really concerned about and they're also very, very concerned when they realise that they didn't understand, uh, they, did, they weren't aware of it. And then the other issue is around quality and control and management. And management and um, staff are very, very concerned about quality regulation issues with open education. So there's a range of um, benefits uh, to the work that I'm not going to go into here, but I will obviously share the slides with you. Um, so it, it, it's benefited our educators on an individual level, at a school level, and at a city-wide level. And also, this is just an example of um, what one of our educators did with the work that we actually produced. So the guidance that I showed you earlier, one of our um, teachers repurposed that work to create computing curriculum resources for primary school children. So immediately you can see that um, the process can model what it's actually trying to achieve and actually try and support, practically support learners and educators in terms of its format and in, and in terms of the content as well. So I'll finish there. I'm um, on Twitter probably far too much. Um, my username is Joseph Fraser. You can always get hold of me um, there, unfortunately. Uh, so please do connect with me there if you've got questions that you want to ask outside of this session. Very happy if you want to ask questions inside of this session as well. Thanks. Any questions? One or two questions for Josie? Yes. Uh, Josie, I think uh, um, from from my experience working with teachers, uh, sometimes it seems very simple, like uh, they need to refer to the original author for we are, then to make some adaptation, which is sometimes challenging for them because they need to know the tools. Then they need to leave the copy somewhere if they choose the copyleft approach. And uh, we found actually that if we make a simple uh, repository, very simple, for the original OERs and then maybe editable versions of those OERs if they allow adaptation and editability, and though for <coughs> this copy left somehow, this would facilitate actually the process of, a, of an individual teacher. So would you... Um, would you agree that actually this is a part of the uh, support system for teachers at organizations and this is a must actually for the organization to establish such infrastructure? I'll use, I'll use this one. Yeah, so in terms of repositories, that's a question that always comes up and, uh, and recurs. We, in terms of licensing, we, we went with Creative Commons licensing primarily because they have so many brilliant materials already available for staff to be able to access to find out more. We obviously created our own, our own work to make it more accessible that was targeted directly at school staff. But in terms of the framework of the support of the community, 
um, we kind of focused on Creative Commons. So, so we had um, not the issues of dealing with every single license. We didn't, obviously, staff on the ground have that issue. We didn't allow ourselves the luxury of supporting every single um, open license that was available, although we did make sure that people were aware that Creative Commons is not the only license. So the repository question came up time and time again. And we, uh, and, and I think, yes, it is important to think around that, but we wanted to avoid ourselves going into the repository business for several really good reasons. One, um, it is a, it's, a, it's not a simple thing to do. It's a huge commitment. Very often, amazing repositories vanish because they are not financially or, or personally supported after a, after a project length. And we didn't want to put people into, the, into that position because it's, it's a really harsh position to put people into. Um, the other thing that we wanted to encourage with them was to use their own um, websites. So all of the schools in England have to legally have a website. Um, I'm not sure what the situation is uh, across the rest of Europe. Um, and also to kind of think of the web as the repository and think of search engines as the index because most staff do, don't go to a specific repository for things. They will Google for things. So that was the, pro, that was the very pragmatic approach that we took straight from the outset. Thank you for that question. One more question. Yeah? Yeah, I have one comment as well. I, I think uh, CC BY is already very complicated and I would be so happy if everybody stuck to public domain so you could just reuse it without having yes. this long name yeah. list of names at the bottom, that's only when you reuse yeah. and reuse. My question is what are the advantages for teachers for sharing? Because in a way it's difficult to convince people to share their content and I think there are many advantages. That <coughs> I wonder if you have some in mind that we could use and they look and also just uh, education institutions, why yeah. should they share? Yeah, so th there's kind of two excellent questions there I think, one about licence types and the reason that we went for CC BY was a pragmatic one. Um, staff are, a, a lot of staff and schools are quite loathe, not all of them, but there is a, an attitude with a section of staff that they're kind of loathe to let go of their resources. So actually approaching them with, um, with, a, with a license that doesn't require any accreditation while would make everybody's life easier is psychologically quite a big step. So what, and what we wanted to do is make sure that staff felt that they did have control and they did have autonomy over. So CC BY was our recommendation. We, were, we did a lot of work actually talking to them about different licence types and benefits and, and, and limitations of different licence types. In the um, publication, there's a whole section on benefits. So I will tweet that link and you can copy and paste that because it's CC licensed and you can stick all of that into your own publication and change what you need for your audience. But really th these are kind of the key benefits for, um, for, for us as a city, for us as individual schools and for us as individual practitioners as well I think as, as a community. So it, basically it's recognising that actually practice has changed and that digital is mainstream now. Um, and, and, and reacting to actually what is going on. Um, Modelling is really, really important. So um, as a professional, I shouldn't be standing at the front showing my learners pirated videos. I shouldn't be showing my learners pictures that I've taken from Google and that I haven't attributed and that I, I, I'm not really sure where they're from. It's, you know, for me, that's a basic question of professional practice and, and modelling for your learners. We don't want our learners to do those things, so why would we want our practitioners to do those kinds of things? Um, it's a core component of digital literacy, open education, and understanding open licensing, uh, copyright and IP is a core component of digital literacy. So if we're thinking about taking that seriously, we have to cover that. Um, I think that there's huge benefits to supporting staff in terms of giving them that permission. 
um, legally, it, it puts them in a completely different position in terms of their work and the accessing their own work. So at the moment, if I'm a staff member and I've made this amazing resource, what I'm supposed to do if I leave one organisation and go to work for another is I'm supposed to ask for permission because I don't own that work anymore. I'm supposed to ask for permission to take that work with me to another organisation. That's absolutely crazy, absolutely crazy. So um, it, it basically puts the work into the public sphere and gives staff members the same legal rights to it as other people as well who are going to benefit from that work. Um, public value is a massive one for us and a huge driver in the project work. I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap up, I'm sorry. Um, because these are publicly funded um, positions producing publicly funded work. So it, it's, it's a huge thing that we should squeeze every last drop of benefit from that that we can. I'm going to stop now um, because Thank we've got you. a really exciting speaker coming Thanks up. very much.